In early February of 1987, Alan and Debbie Tallman brought home a bunk bed they had purchased at a second-hand furniture shop. You got that, they assembled the bed and stored it in their basement. That's right, didn't we? When the bunk bed was moved upstairs, it marked the beginning of nine months of horror for the Tallmans. From the moment the bed was first slept in, the house appeared to be haunted by spirits that terrorized first the children, then the entire family. You're getting so big for Daddy. I was afraid for my life. I also was very afraid for my family. I had visions of coming home from work and actually seeing my family destroyed. Um, brutally murdered or, or just laying there dead. The house where the Tallmans lived had no known history of hauntings, and the Tallmans had never in their lives given ghosts a second thought. The irregular churchgoers. Debbie is a housewife and mother, and Alan is shift supervisor in a manufacturing plant. They are credible and responsible citizens, but their paranormal experiences have left them deeply scarred. They asked that actors portray them in this story and that their children's real names not be used. The Tallmans feel they were in a battle with forces they do not understand, a battle they were destined to lose. Oregon, Wisconsin is a small farming town of 3,800 people. It is a safe and prosperous place, hardly the spot one would expect to have a terrifying encounter with the supernatural. All the scenes that we recreated were filmed in this house, the very place where the Tallmans had their uncanny meeting with the world of spirits. The Tallman family moved into the house on April 13th, 1986. Well, yeah, it was our dream house because, you know, it was something that we figured we were going to be there for a long time, you know, and it was, it was a dream house. Are you feeling any better? Within weeks, the Tallman children, who had rarely been sick, began to fall ill. After we moved into the house, it seemed like our children were sick all the time. We had them into the doctor's office. Sometimes I would have all three of them in, in a week. In late May of 1987, Debbie and Alan moved the bunk bed they had bought upstairs. That night, the Tallman's son, Danny, was sleeping in the room next door to the bunk bed. Fishing, okay? Good. Have a good night. Okay. The bedrooms had been rearranged, and Danny had inherited his parents' old clock radio. On this night, the radio seemed to take on a life of its own. My son, he uh, came running out in the living room, and he says, but Mom and Dad, he says, I seen it. It, it, the dial moved. He said the indicator went from one side to the radio to the other. And we kind of looked at each other and says, well, if you're going to have a fit with the radio and cause this kind of ruckus, we'll just take the radio out, you know, because that stuff just does not happen. A few weeks later, Alan Tallman himself had an experience he could not explain. He was busy painting the walls in his basement, but decided to take a break. My wife called me up for dinner, so I just laid the brush and I was going to return after I ate my lunch. And after um, dinner time was over, I went downstairs, down cellar. And the brush was in the paint pail uh, with the bristles sticking up right in the paint pail. I figured there was something strange why this happened, uh, why the brush got into the paint pail, but uh, I would, at, still I, I wouldn't accept that my house was haunted. With eyes. The Tallman's two-year-old daughter was sleeping in the bunk bed. She began to see things in her room. At one time, my daughter had talked about um, a witch behind her door um, and the fire. A lot of it was fire, and we had never mentioned it to our son at all. And then about, i say probably about a month later, he had said, Mom, I saw an old lady standing by my door. And um, he said that she glowed like fire. 
at this point, I began to think that our house was probably haunted. Sit down, let's talk all this, this out here. The Tallmans were desperate. They turned to their family pastor. He felt the presence of evil in the house and thought they might be the victims of the devil. I'd known them about a year and a half when they called me to come and visit with them about what was going on in the house. Is this, uh, is this normal? I, mean, this I believe that my initial analysis of uh, the entity being in the spiritual realm, the occult realm, the demonic, if you will, was accurate. And I still believe it's accurate. The Tallmans claim they never had a moment's peace. Doors banged open and shut. Strange voices called to them. Mom? The visions persisted. The children were terrorized. Mom! I don't want the week to... before Christmas, Danny once again saw there. something that horrified him. It's okay. Come on. Nobody's here. You're okay. Oh, lady. I've done everything that I can. Alan had reached his breaking point. He totally lost control and challenged the entity. I was like a like a wild man running around in my house, and I couldn't get no control over it. Come out of there! Show yourself to me! I started yelling on the top of my voice. I said, what's ever in our house, would you please leave my children alone? And if you want to fight, fight with me. Three weeks later, on January the 7th, Alan Tallman returned home from working the late shift around 2 a.m. Outside the garage, he heard an eerie, howling sound. He went to investigate. It started out real soft, and then it got real loud. It was a real strong howling of wind, but it was quiet outside. And a voice came out of, out of the howling, and it says, come here. I ran around the sides of the house, looking to see if anybody was there, and I couldn't see nothing. So I went back to the house steps, and the vacuum of the wind started up again. It started out real soft, and it got real loud. And the voice said, come here, and it, it, kept this, it just kept on saying, come here, come here. And I focused onto the garage door, and I seen a glow. And I run. I got scared, and I ran. And I ran to the house, and I opened the door, and I set my lunch pail on the floor. I locked the door, and I stood there for a brief couple of seconds. And I says, oh my god, my garage is on fire. And I ran back out, to, out on the porch, and I looked towards the garage, and there was nothing. The, the garage was just as normal as when I came home from work. So I quick went back in the house, and I closed the door and deadbolted the door and locked the door. After I had the door locked, I reached down to, to pick up my lunch pail, and this thing hurtled it right through the living room. He came home that night, and he was just running around the room. I mean, literally running. He ran in the bedroom, ran around the bed, ran over to the dresser, threw his keys up on the dresser. I've never seen him like that before. Alan Tallman began sleeping on the floor of his daughter's room each night. The girls were traumatized and needed help falling asleep. I started to see this um, fog starting to appear on the floor, and a voice came out of it, and it says, you're dead. When he came out of the bedroom, he wouldn't talk to me. His, his lips were blue, he was, just, he was so white, you know. I tried to get him to tell me what happened, but all he did was stand there, and, and he was, tears were running out of his eyes. And so I went to the phone, and I called the pastor, and I said, you've got to come over here. I said, something happened, and Alan's crying. I said, and he won't tell me what happened. When I arrived, Alan was very frightened. He was shaking. He was visibly shaken at what he had seen. Alan gave me no indication at all that he was in any way fabricating what he was telling me. And my sense of that was heightened by the fact that I've been with people before who had described things similar to what Alan was describing. And his fear and, and terror at what he had seen was very similar to what I had seen before. A few days later, Alan was working late. He asked a relative of his to watch over the two girls until they fell asleep. Alan's relative was a complete skeptic. That night, 
he changed his mind. The same specter appeared. What is it? The relative came out of the bedroom, and I said, what happened? And he was scared. I said, where's the baby? He goes back in the bedroom. I said, get her. I said, we are leaving this house. I said, I am never coming back to this house. I said, I don't care. I said, I have had it. I can't handle this no more. That night, Debbie fled from the house she had thought would be her dream home. Hurry up! Two weeks after they fled their home, Alan and Debbie Tongman had the bunk bed destroyed. After we left the house, everybody asked us, can this follow you? I never thought it could happen the first time. So I don't know if this is the end of the story. The Tallmans have moved to another city now, and so far they've experienced no paranormal phenomena. A new family moved into the Tallmans house last April, and they've had no problems. Perhaps in the world of spirits, as well as in the world of human beings, it is possible simply to be in the wrong place at the wrong time.